Uh, we're currently under attack right now, same location. So in today's video, I'm going to take a walk around Odessa with an American who had moved to Ukraine and with the war, with the invasion on the 20th of February 2022, he took up his adopted homeland's call and went to protect the city and the country that he had made his second home. So when you're watching this interview, I want you to think, what would you do if the country that you had moved to was suddenly invaded by its neighbor? What decisions would you make and would you step up to the plate? Sar experience. So greetings from Odessa Mama. And in today's video, I have an American who have invited on who has been serving in the Ukrainian military and been living here in Odessa and he has a really interesting story to tell. So Alex Tobiasen is your last name? Tobiasen. Tobiasen, okay. Pronounce it a little bit too German-esque. Yeah. <laughs> so Tobiasen. And uh, you are from where in the US originally? Oh, well, I'm originally from Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, but you know, I lived everywhere in the southern New England area. Okay, so you were living there in the U.S. We're here in the city garden in the center of Odessa. It is day 219 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's actually the day that uh, Vladimir Putin announced that apparently he owns Jupiter at this stage or Mars. I know he was there trying to claim he annexed many parts of Ukraine that you've actually been to even recently Correct. with the military. Maybe before we get into that, tell us um, how did you end up in Ukraine? Uh, well, I came to Ukraine in 2016. I was traveling through Europe and um, I have Ukrainian heritage uh, as well as that. Ah, okay. Yeah, so I always figured that, you know, Ukraine would be an interesting place to come travel to, uh, given the fact it's really not as popular as a lot of the other European countries. Um, and at the time, I was also studying a bit of the Russian language. so. I figured, you know, why not? So I came here to uh, Kiev, and I pretty much have been here ever since. Oh, wow, okay. So I didn't realize you also had a little bit of background uh, with Ukraine in your family history. Uh, so you came to Ukraine, and you enlisted in the military here. Correct. Uh, how did that happen? Uh, did you have a background in the military beforehand or was what, what prompted that decision? Uh, yeah, so I spent five years in the United States Army. I was a paratrooper and I did a deployment in 2012 to Afghanistan. Uh, and I got discharged from the U.S. Army honorably in 2015. And um, I was going to community, community college uh, and I decided, you know, I'd take some time off and travel, travel the world a little bit. And I uh, came here to Ukraine and started settling down and one thing led to another. Um, and, you know, I found myself deciding that I wanted to stay here and serve this country uh, just like I served, you know, my, my native country back in the United States because I made the decision to live here. Okay. And what prompted you to decide to settle down here? Uh, well, I actually uh, got married uh, to a Ukrainian woman, uh, and this was back in 2017. And we have a beautiful five-year-old daughter now. Oh, wow. Um, so all this pretty much coincided together, and, you know, one thing led to another, and I decided that if I'm going to stay here, I would like to uh, have a career, uh, have another chance at building a career in something that I love doing. Uh, so, and at the same time, I could give back and I could serve, uh, you know, the great people of this nation and do my part in society. So I decided to enlist in the Ukrainian Marines. In the Marines. So this was when exactly? It was a few years ago? Yes. Uh, so back in 2017, I spent one year with the Georgian National Legion uh, and they were attached to the 25th Battalion, which was the Ukrainian Army. Uh, but in 2018, I signed a three-year contract with the Ukrainian Marines, uh, and I served in 36th Brigade, 1st Battalion, uh, Dishair, that stands for uh, Desantne Storm Rota, uh, which is an air assault company. Uh, so I ended up serving in Nikolaya for three years, doing multiple deployments to the Donbass. Okay, wow. So before the February 24th invasion, uh, you had actually been to Donbass, where there was uh, active combat. Correct. After fighting. Correct. And what was that like as an experience? Because, I mean, uh, you're an American, 
<laughs> and uh, you find yourself in the midst of this um, war between Russia and Ukraine, your adopted homeland. And it had already been ongoing when you came here. Obviously, it started in 2014. Uh, what was that like? What is it like being, I don't know, on the front line? I've never, well, obviously, I've never served in the military. Or I mean, uh, to begin with, um, what, what pretty much prompted me in, in going through and uh, with the decision of, of joining the military and going through with these deployments was the fact that, you know, my wife's from Donetsk. Okay. And I, uh, I had like a clear understanding of exactly what was going on here, like what the political situation was, what the climate and atmosphere was like. Uh, she moved from Donetsk in 2014 to escape the war. Okay. Uh, she moved to Lviv and we met up in Kiev. Uh, so, you know, after having like a real understanding of what everything was about, I, I felt that Ukraine was, was in the right. And, um, Again, that, that gave me more motivation, especially having a child uh, here in Ukraine. That gave me the motivation to go out there and serve and uh, protect. Um, but as it goes about the uh, experience out there on the front line, uh, it was much different than the experiences that I, uh, I had when I was in Afghanistan. Uh, for example, uh, just the conditions of daily living uh, living in a trench, not having running water, um, you know, not having any of the luxuries like electricity, things that we have here and take for granted for, uh, that wasn't abundant out there. Um, you know, so besides having the duty of an infantryman or a soldier, which is to fight, you also had uh, daily chores, uh, you know, that you had to do, such as like water collection, okay. collecting food, you know, chopping wood. Um, and of course, you know, being outside in the elements, such as winter time, uh, it could get miserable at times. You know? All right, so it was a very different experience from being in the US military. Absolutely. Uh, was that a result of just the professionalism level or the resource level? Um, um, or the actual places that the, the fighting was going I, on in different terrain? I think it would be a combination of all three. Uh, once again, you know, Ukraine's military is pretty much a new one. Uh, so a lot of uh, traditions that they might have had from the Soviet era uh, kind of were still applied, uh, which wasn't very good. Uh, as well as the fact that we were fighting more of a conventional war where there was these lines, you know where your enemy is, uh, there's no surprises, there's not really urban um, combat operations, but you're fighting in fields, you're fighting in woodland. Okay, wow, so it's, uh, I've heard it, we'll get into this in a sec, what happened since February 24th, but I've heard it described in Donbass, there's more like the First World War, where trench warfare, we've seen a lot of that in this war since February 24th, so that would be a more accurate description. It's exactly. like, wow, so a bit more like the First World War. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're, you're out there, you're digging trenches, uh, you're in the mud up to your ankles, your knees, you know. So. Do people get trench foot still? Is that the thing? Uh, or? It, you know what, people take care of themselves, but today, you know, the best thing was, which I learned, is actually having rubber boots. A lot of guys go out there, they want all these like really cool guy operator boots, you know, like mountain hiking boots, but it doesn't, doesn't uh, do you too much. Uh, it doesn't actually there. help if you're yeah. stuck in the trenches. You need rubber boots. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Alex, are you filming yeah. the last moment of your life? I hope not. I think we should make a run for the bunker. Uh, yeah, that, that might be a good option. Who's going first? I'll go. Is that a good idea? So tell me a little bit more about how you met your wife because this is a bit of a classical Ukrainian story yes. in the sense that a uh, Western guy comes over to Ukraine, meets a woman, and yeah. then they create a family. So how did that happen exactly? Well, I guess it's a, a bit stereotypic, um, especially this late in the game. I've noticed pretty much all guys who come out here, they end up having, you know, Ukrainian wives or girlfriends and it goes in that direction. You know, we find love. Uh, but my situation was Pretty unique, you know. My wife was actually the administrator of a hostel that I was living in in Kiev. So 
Um, you know, she was actually the first hostel I stayed at, okay. uh, and we just got along really good, you know, and we started going out to parties. Uh, we had a lot of the same common interests. Uh, we like electronic music, we like techno, um, you know, so uh, we naturally just had a bond that subsided very quickly. Excellent. Uh, and actually, that's why I chose this, this particular t-shirt with after party uh, for today's for today's shoot, because I know that you DJ here in Odessa. Uh, why did you choose Odessa, actually? If your wife is from Donbass and you met up in Kiev uh, and you're an American, why would you settle on Odessa as the city to, you know, create your family? Odessa mama. Odessa mama, <laughs> Odessa mama. Why Odessa mama? Uh, well, you know, it's really because of the, the sea. I mean, to put, the it short, seaside, yeah, yeah. to put it shortly, it's all about the beach, it's all about the sea. Uh, we love the energy and the vibes that come from the city. Uh, there's a lot of different like foreign cultures and influence here, uh, like primarily in Odessa. Uh, and it's just something about this city in particular, the architecture, uh, just the, how the way people carry themselves. Uh, Odessa is a very attractive place. And growing up in Rhode Island, growing up in Southern New England, I was always near the coastline. Uh, so it, to me, it's like I really need uh, water around me to feel uh, natural, feel like I'm at home. So Odessa is the spot. Excellent. I can definitely relate to that, having grown up on the west coast of Ireland. One of the reasons I also like Odessa is definitely the seaside, uh, the vibe here. Um, and then you set up your, you know, obviously you have, a, uh, you have a family here, you have a child here, and your wife and you've all been living here. Uh, what were you doing in Odessa before the war? Because I mentioned obviously the DJ stuff. Uh, so there was like, there was a couple of months in which I just finished my contract uh, and I started kind of doing the classic uh, Western thing to do, which would be like teach English. Okay. Um, but that was really just to like help pay the bills. But my main hobby, like the main thing that I'm enthusiastic about is uh, DJing. Uh, I love techno music, especially like hard techno, industrial techno, and um, I produce a little bit myself. And here in Odessa, there's just like an amazing uh, techno scene, you know. Okay. So it really, this is a this is a good place for that too. Excellent. That's one thing that I always explain to the guys who are my clients. Normally, is like you have to. Uh, like provide value within the community. You can't just show up and just think, hey, I'm the Westerner, everybody should just love me. But you know, you have to find your role in the city's kind of uh, life and soul, right? And yeah. be able to contribute values. That's super cool. Absolutely. So he's a DJ here. Uh, definitely a, a cool thing to be involved in. Right now I'm moving out to position of defense. We got our weapons, we're ready to go. One second. All right, so we just had news that they might be coming to Odessa. We're moving in route now. Alex is driving. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're ready to defend this, this city to the last breath. Okay. So, Alex, February 24th happened, right? Obviously, everybody's aware that Russia kind of continued their original invasion for 2014, and they attacked uh, a lot greater parts of Ukraine, basically the entire country this time. Where were you on February 24th? On February 24th, I was here in Odessa. I remember I was... Um, Really early in the morning, my wife woke me up and the first thing she said to me was, it started. And I knew exactly what she meant by that. Yeah. Uh, if you remember for weeks, uh, maybe even months, there was talk uh, coming down the pipeline, the United States, different news agencies were reporting about this big, massive buildup on the border and how uh, invasion was imminent. And a lot of people here in Ukraine, you know, they didn't really believe it. Uh, a lot of them were pretty skeptical. Uh, they thought, you know, this is just another game Putin's playing with the West. Uh, but, you know, I took that threat pretty seriously. I thought there was possibly like an 85% chance that there was going to be an invasion. Okay, so. wow. So you thought 85% even a few weeks before or just, yeah. The, yeah. Okay, because yeah. I actually put it a little bit less than that. I thought it was a 50-50, probably about three weeks out. And then when he made that speech, um, it was what? about two days before the invasion, I was like, okay, this doesn't look very good at yeah, all. It looks like it's highly Especially when uh, the DNR uh, announced that there was some kind of like uh, car bombing and yeah. they were mobilizing people and evacuating women and children. That's when I knew the, the war pretty much started. Okay, that's interesting as a, as a feedback. So we can recognize this in the future. You know, this is the telltale signs that people are preparing for uh, war. And February 24th, you were here uh, what was the reaction in the city? You said that people were caught off guard. They were a bit surprised. What was actually happening here in the yeah, center of Odessa? 
I remember, uh, so basically, you know, we, we started tuning into telegram channels, social media, calling friends, trying to get all the information we could uh, about the situation. And a lot of people had a lot of disinformation about there was paratroopers enter the yeah, city. Uh, people were saying there were landing crafts and there was a marine invasion already and there were soldiers in city center. Uh, so, you know, the, the atmosphere was quite chaotic. People were panicking. So it was mainly panic. I remember there was disinformation about the paratroopers and we weren't sure if there was actually an amphibious uh, landing taking place and it was quite, yeah. I mean, obviously there was a lot of things happening all over the country. Correct. Obviously they, Russia did attack with land forces, Kharkiv, Mykolaiv, Kherson, uh, Kiev itself, but in the end they didn't attack here. What did you do uh, on that day when you, uh, obviously your, your first priority was your family, I, Absolutely, I assume. Absolutely, yeah. So I immediately said to my wife that we need to get out of here. Uh, she wanted to stay. Wow, so, okay, yeah. even with the war. Even with the war, she was like, you know, it's my country, it's my home, I want to stay. I said, okay, I respect that, but I'm going to go uh, get my gear and I'm going to go check into um, the Vyanka Mat, which yeah. is, you know, yeah. like a military uh, enlistment center. And uh, as I was doing that, uh, a rocket flew over our house and it was very loud. Uh, it blew up maybe a kilometer away. Uh, oh, crazy. Shook, yeah, shook our entire house, all the car alarms on our street went off. And my wife looked at me and she's like, I want to get out of here. Yeah, you know? yeah. So then when she saw that, wow, this is really too close for comfort. Like this is a kilometer away where like the building is shaking. We need to get the hell out of here. And where exactly. did you go? Uh, so I picked up uh, my daughter. We grabbed all of our central items yeah. and uh, we just drove for the Romanian border. Okay, so from here you went to the Romanian border. Did you go through Moldova? Or? Uh, no, we, we went straight to uh, the border crossing with just Ukraine and um, oh, okay. Romania. So that was the boat? Yeah. Uh, no, we went to Rini. Oh, you went to Rini, okay. Yeah. That's, uh, that's actually just two kilometers inside Moldova. But or that might actually yeah. have Moldova. Yeah, it is actually. It's a very small you, you, uh, border. I don't know what it was like on that day. Maybe they made an exemption and they let everyone across, but you normally have to go two kilometers through Moldova, which is annoying, obviously, yeah. if you're trying to get the hell out to Romania. Well, it, it was interesting, because at first, you know, they when we first showed up there, they are all about having COVID vaccines, ah, imagine. Yeah, going through all the bureaucracy, and then finally they were just like, you know, uh, forget about it. Everybody, <laughs> just, just get inside the country, you know? Yeah, that's interesting, because I left on day two, and uh, there was no talk about COVID or anything like that on the Romanian border crossing I went through. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty amazing if they're still asking for COVID certs. Hey, yeah. didn't you notice that there's a war? I, I, <laughs> I tell people all the time, it was like as the war came and COVID went. Yeah, exactly. It, uh, uh, Russia killed COVID, I guess. Yeah, COVID <laughs> doesn't exist <laughs> anymore. anymore. Uh, definitely in this area. So, okay, you got your family to safety in Romania. And then, as you said, you had gone to the enlistment office here in Odessa. Uh, so what happened next? You, you came back to Odessa? Yes, um, fortunately I had a few friends, uh, which I served with previously, who are also living here in Odessa. And we kind of formed up together, kind of weighed out our options of exactly what we wanted to do, uh, what route we wanted to take. And um, we knew that the fighting was going on in the Kherson region. Uh, so at that point we decided that we would um, drive out to Kherson and just kind of fall in on any unit uh, that was willing to accept us. Okay, and which unit was that in the end? Well, in the very beginning, uh, we drove out to Kherson and we, were, we, got, we made our way to city center and uh, I gotta tell you, there was no fighting in the city itself. Okay. So we started driving outside the city, kind of towards Oleshki. Yeah, I know uh, Oleshki sounds, I went there. Exactly, once we got to this area, we came across a few destroyed uh, Ukrainian tanks and uh, BTRs. Okay. Uh, I had one Lada just drive like 100 miles per hour past me. And all of a sudden from wood lines, machine gun fire just wow. started opening up. Wow, so it was like, uh... But was it a Russian or a Ukrainian? Russians, wow. yeah, yeah. So they had uh, commandeered a civilian uh, vehicle yeah. and then converted it to be able to shoot it out of it. Were they wearing uniform or did you even see any of this? Uh, well, the lot of that drove by, no, the guy was a civilian. Uh, the machine gun fire came from the wood line outside. Oh, from so the wood line, okay. The oh, okay, so it wasn't in the vehicle, right. Okay, so I understand, yeah. So this is crazy. So this is in Oleshki? Yes. Wow, Oleshki Sands. And that's the thing, there was... Uh, I remember there was a U Ukrainian military camp nearby. I remember that because yeah, I've um, actually come across it when I was. Uh, because, yeah, because when I was serving in the Marines, the main uh, polygon, which is like a Russian word for a training center, uh, that's Izoleshki Sands yeah, or the yeah, Marines. Remember, is. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, wow. So this is one of the reasons to go down there. And then what happened next? So you're in a lash key, you're under fire. We're in a fire. lash key, we're under fire, and um, we banked a U, turned around, started driving back towards your zone, and we came across uh, four Ukrainian soldiers that kind of like waved us, you know, waved us over to them. Uh, so we picked these guys up and one of them needed to go back to Kherson. He wanted to go to his house and the other three wanted to go to Mykolaiv. Uh, and at that moment, there was like a big rush of all Ukrainian forces were going back to Mykolaiv because the Russian armor column was actually sidestepping uh, the city of Kherson and it was going north and it was wrapping around uh, okay. Mykolaiv. Uh, so we ended up falling back to Mykolaiv with, with a big convoy of uh, Ukrainian soldiers. Okay, so back to Mykolaiv. I know they went Novokohovka and then across obviously up to Bosnysensk where they were stopped eventually yeah. a few days later. Crazy. So, wow, so you're there in Mykolaiv, in Mykolaiv. Uh, and they see the city is... Um, preparing for a siege or defense, yeah, I guess. Yeah, there was point. police cars everywhere. Uh, there was just armor, like army personnel everywhere. Everyone running around, very chaotic. Uh, people shouting out orders, people blocking vehicles, making, uh, you know, positions, like hasty fighting positions were going up around the city. Uh, and there was rumors that they were actually going to blow up the main bridge that connects, yeah, yeah uh, mainland Mykolaiv, the city, to the other half. Because they did not do that in Novokohovka, because it's a dam. It, I mean, obviously, you did have some, that small bridge across where there's a canal. And the big controversy was Kherson, I think, at the time, because they didn't blow up that, uh, I think it's called Antonovska Bridge. I can't remember the exact name of it is, but it's a big bridge they've driven yeah. across. That didn't happen. So if they were worried about the Russian forces getting across uh, that bridge, uh, then they would blow it up. It would make sense to me, because then the road would be open here to Odessa. Correct. Okay. So pretty chaotic people trying to make decisions under a lot of pressure, not exactly. really having full information about what the Russian strategy is. Can they defend Mykolaiv or not? Uh, and this is how many days into the This war? is February 25th. Oh, this is the day. Yeah. This wow. Is so when I was trying to leave across the border in Romania, you were already back in uh, Mykolaiv. Yes. And her son, Oleshki. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. So you managed to get your, uh, yeah, to get your wife and uh, daughter to uh, Romania. Then you, you came back within a day. Crazy. Man. Um, and then, what were the next steps? Because uh, things stabilized things, uh, uh, over yeah. maybe about 10 days later, maybe, because obviously the Russians took, um, um, they continued to advance. I think it was it around 10 days? They started, they continued their advance north, mm -hmm. uh, but they were, they were completely stopped uh, when they tried to enter the city of Mykolaiv. Okay. Uh, their advance was halted, and we were able to push them all the way back down to about where they are right now. Okay. Because I know they get up to Vosnesensk, because my girlfriend's from Vosnesensk originally, and that was the furthest north they got on that axis. And then they were stopped, and obviously, then they retreated to where they are now. So since that time, what have you been uh, doing? You came back from the front, obviously you were here in Odessa. Correct. Uh, well, I came back from the front in uh, early June. So uh, as soon as I came back, I actually took over the training operations for the uh, Odessa Territorial Defense. Okay, so now you're training Ukrainians or foreigners or? I'm um, training the Ukrainian Armed Forces, uh, 126 Brigade to be exact. Um, it's the Territorial Defense. It was uh, basically a new brigade created um, right after the onset of the invasion. Uh, so the guys who are in it were all civilians prior to the war. Okay. Uh, so that's why it's so important right now to give them, you know, um, really good uh, training. Okay, excellent. So you're doing that. That's your main focus at the moment. How do you think the war will end? Because um, we're here, it's, uh, what date is it today? It's like September 30th or is it October 30th. 1st? This is, uh, 30th. Yeah, September 30th, 2022. And, uh, you know, Ukraine in the last month in particular has pushed Russian forces back to take a lot of Kharkiv Oblast, some parts of Donetsk and Luhansk in particular, a little bit of Kherson. How do you see things developing from here? Overall, I see a Ukrainian victory imminent. Uh, you know, I would say already Ukraine has won this war because Russia's uh, primary objectives from the very beginning was to take control of the entire country. It was to seize Kiev, it was to seize Odessa, uh, it was to get rid of the Zelensky administration, and it was for a full takeover of Ukraine, and they failed already in all those aspects. Uh, so what we have now are little 
bits and pieces of Jeberizia Oblast as well as um, Hirson Oblast, like you said, Kharkov. Uh, most of Kharkov has just been liberated by Ukrainian forces. Exactly, there's um, only a tiny, tiny bit still exactly. under occupation. And to put it in perspective, prior to the invasion, uh, most of Donbass, which you have Donetsk Oblast and Luhansk Oblast, uh, was already under separatist control. And uh, the amount of territory that the Russian forces have been able to uh, take since February 24th is extremely minute. Uh, so that being said, they've even failed in their overall objective to take over the Donbass. Yeah, I mean, they keep changing their, their objectives officially. First, it's like uh, denazification in inverted commas. Uh, which doesn't really mean anything to anyone. You just call whoever they like a Nazi and say, yeah, we're going to kill you or get rid of you simply because we're denazifying. We're demilitarizing again. Does that mean, <laughs> what, what does that mean? Does it mean there's yeah. no Ukrainian army left or no independent Ukrainian army left? And then the territory thing. Um, yeah, immediately they see the, you know, the interpretation is denazification uh, objective was that, well, they called Zelensky basically uh, a Nazi and a drug addict. So yeah. it was so, basically changed the government. So that's failed. They've failed to take Kiev. They've obviously failed to take Kharkiv because they were there on the outskirts of the city on day one and two. They have, uh, at the moment, they're holding on grimly to Kherson. Um, they, they never got to Zaporizhia. So major conurbations, uh, they basically have what they had at the beginning, which was Donetsk and Luhansk. Yeah, um, uh, with the exception of Mariupol. Mariupol, sorry, I forgot Mariupol, which, but they, yeah, unfortunately, tragically, they absolutely raised that city to the ground in barbaric uh, fashion. Uh, during that siege, there were some British uh, POWs, to, POWs who were taken. Correct. We're in a similar situation to you. They have been part of the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, Aiden Aslan was one, Sean, Sean Pinner. Pinner, yeah. Uh, have you met those guys? Yes, yeah, so actually I have a, a very personal relationship uh, built with Aiden Oslin and Sean Pinner. Uh, I served with both of them in uh, 36th Brigade 1st Battalion of the Ukrainian Marines. Uh, so, okay, so you guys were actually fighting together in Donbass. Yeah, we, uh, we, we did deployment together in the Pavlopol, which is a, a village outside Mariupol. Okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, when I first heard that they were on the front on deployment when this invasion happened, I knew already that they were like in trouble and that they were gonna be in Mariupol. And okay. um, they held out in Mariupol all the way to the very end. And uh, they ended up surrendering when there was no more means to continue on uh, resistance. You know, they ran out of ammunition, they ran out of water, they ran out of supplies. Uh, their command gave the order to surrender. Uh, and, um, you know, it was very tragic at first when we heard that they were sentenced yeah. to death by the uh, DNR court system. Uh, but, you know, just recently, we were all given the great news that they've been returned in a prisoner swap. And um, again, that was one of the best, you know, news I ever gotten in my life. Was that yeah, see, because that was wasn't looking off. good about two weeks ago. Yeah, I remember there was a British humanitarian worker who was uh, under, uh, I guess, detained. Was detained by the same. I would call them. I don't even know whether to call them separatists or by the Russian forces, because that's basically what they are. They're just a series of different militias or formations. And he died um, while yeah. in detention. So. Yeah, it's good to see that they got out. Um, yeah, I can imagine that you feel like in another set of circumstances, you might have been in Mariupol or yeah. they gotten around you in Leshki and it would have been the same uh, situation. Uh, at the time, the, the Russian side was claiming that they're mercenaries. Um, I mean, I have a legal background, so for mm -hmm. me, what, what do you think about it first, the claim that they're mercenaries? So, why it was baseless was because uh, Sean and Aiden signed up to join the Marine Corps. They enlisted in the Marines just like anyone else could, you know. Uh, they were already temporary citizens in this country. Uh, they were living here and established. So they were residents? They were residents. Oh, were they already citizens, do you know? No, they weren't citizens, but they were residents. And, um, you know, they went into the office, they joined up, they went to basic training, uh, they took the oath of enlistment. And in all sense, you know, they're integrated, they're members of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. It's just like uh, while serving in the U.S. military, we have a lot of uh, immigrants that might come from Latin America okay. or Europe or any other countries like Asia. 
And, um, you know, a lot of them, they get their green card and then they join the U.S. Army ah, and they, okay. they establish themselves as citizens. So it's the same thing here in this country. You know, they're not okay. mercenaries, they're contract soldiers. Yeah, and they were here for many years beforehand in the armed forces. So I don't even understand how you could even try to claim that they're mercenaries with a straight face. But, yeah, that's just kind of how it rolls with uh, the Russian side in this, in this war. It's not very, uh, most of it's very illogical what they start to claim all the time. Uh, what are your plans going forward? Because, yeah, this is... Uh, Odessa Mama. Odessa Mama. And uh, as I mentioned, you like to DJ Love and stuff it. like that. So you're planning to stay in, a, yeah. in Odessa? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here until the end of the war. And I'm going to probably stay here even after. So. Okay. And actually, we met before. I probably should have started the interview by, by uh, saying that because you reached out to me. Where did we meet? Oh, we met at a Solomon's concert <laughs> at Ibiza uh, Beach Club. <laughs> exactly. There was this legendary night out at Ibiza Club a couple of years ago. It was 2019, I remember yeah, it well. Yeah. Solomon came and uh, it was a kind of a, a huge party here in the center, well, not in the center of Odessa, but out at the beach at Ibiza Club at Arcadia. And uh, yeah, crazy. So yeah. we actually had met socially uh, before. And uh, thanks for the interview, Alex. Thank I you. I really appreciate what you've done personally and helping to defend Ukraine. Obviously, this is a very difficult period. It's For me, I, I see it as kind of like a great patriotic war for Ukraine. And it will firmly, I mean, it was already independent for 30 years, but Russia, uh, basically the Kremlin didn't, decided they didn't like that and they decided to try and reverse it. So I really appreciate your contributions. And I'm looking forward to us meeting up socially uh, in the future come at other parties. Rave. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm looking to forward. <laughs> exactly. We go back to way, the way things were before this, this phase of the war, because they did start in 2014. So uh, Thank Slava, you for your I, guess, support. I guess I didn't comment on his two. Yeah. Should I put the after party one? But he put one that normally I actually works. Exactly. Ruski <laughs> Karabo. So on that, um, Slava Ukraina. Harom Slava, Topobachina, and see you in the next video. Ciao, ciao from Adyasa Mama in free Ukraine. And soon it will be joined by the rest of the country. Sar Experience.